Hello, everyone. It is July. <clears throat> wow. Okay. All right. July 18th, 2018. And it is Unfound Live. I hope everybody is having a beautiful week. It was, uh, hello, Andrea. Oh, well, everybody's this green. What is this? This must be new for Unfound. Uh, hello, Andrea and Angel and Shuri. And what is this, all this green? Hello, Joyce. Um, hope everybody's doing well tonight. I don't know what's the deal with all the green that's coming in here. That's uh, kind of funny. Um, Tammy, and we got a lot to talk about tonight. Uh, we have a lot, a lot, a lot to talk about. Hello, MJ. Good to see you. And uh, we're going to take some questions. going to tell you what's been going on with some of the things I've been doing. Hello, Sarah. Um, Suzanne tuning in from Canada. Love to see the Canadian listeners and viewers. Um, I'm going to start out with this very quickly. All right. And hello, Tracy. And if any of you uh, have any questions you'd like me to answer this evening, anything in particular about anything that comes to mind, as long as it's PG rated, please type it down there. And I will try to answer it for you. I already have some questions and I'm planning on answering uh, tonight from listeners and viewers. Hello, Tracy and Laura and Kelsey and Dan. Dan, thank you for your contribution earlier this week. Deeply appreciated. Um, I'm going to start right here. Hello, Barbara. Uh, you'll see Joyce. She is in the group tonight. Of course, Joyce, uh, mother of Peggy and Patty McDaniel. She posted something in the group uh, about 25 minutes ago, and I just got off the phone with her. Hello, Penny and Kimberly. And she claims that she saw some video about Sheriff Lewis and maybe others um, criticizing conspiracy theorists. I have not seen this video. And she and I just had about a 10-minute conversation about this. And this regards, of course, the Thomas Brown case. That is news to me. So I'm asking anybody, maybe from the Texas Panhandle, and I know some of you are tuning in tonight, do you know anything about this video? Hello, Janet. I haven't talked to you in a while, Janet. Uh, we have to talk soon uh, again soon. Um, does any does that sound familiar to anybody out there? That I guess this would be a recent video. Let's say within the last two months, maybe since I don't know. Since you know, I first found out about the case back in April, even maybe that Sheriff Lewis said something. Um, derogatory or something about conspiracy theorists out there. Uh, hello, Michelle. Hello, Anne. Um, Kara, good to see you tonight. If any of you have seen anything like that, I would surely like to know about it. That is totally news to me. Now, you have to keep in mind, Joyce is in Florida, in the panhandle of Florida. So I'm guessing this must have been something that she saw online because I do not believe that Thomas is um disappearance is a national story yet i'm personally working on that but to my knowledge it has not been a, a story that somebody would see on in florida on tv um michelle you don't have to apologize we're just getting started tonight uh usually takes a little while to run, uh, warm up here um does anybody know anything about that that sheriff lewis made a comment like that maybe within the last couple months now i'm guessing maybe in 2017, he did that. But if he's made something, a comment recently, that is news to me. So if anybody's seen like anything like that, please contact me. Please write something in the comment section because I, I would like to know about it. I don't know if Penny knows about it. I would think that – I'm just thinking that if anybody in Texas heard or saw something like that, they would have contacted me, and I've not been contacted. Uh, Kara, Michelle – uh, Carrie, listening while on the road, fantastic. Keep your eyes on the road, Carrie, please. Joey, Stephanie, good to see you. Uh, Heather says, I've not seen anything, and I'm in the Texas panhandle. See, I, I'm just wondering if that was maybe something that Joyce saw that was old from 2017. I don't know. I'm not there. 
and I don't watch TV, as you all know. So, um, I don't know. And Carrie says, haven't heard anything in central Missouri. All right, we're just going to put that out there for now. You can spread that around. Maybe somebody can get on YouTube or do a search or Google search or something like that. We can we can maybe figure this out. Uh, and sure, yeah, please, uh, if you can hunt that down, Sherry, that would have been fantastic. Joey, hello to you. Um, let's move on to other things. I have to go to a funeral tomorrow. Um, my best friends, and when I say my best friends, there are multiple brothers who are my best friends. Um, hello, Dee Dee. Uh, they lost their mother uh, back last Friday. And so I'm going to the funeral home tomorrow afternoon slash evening uh, to see them. This is just a coincidence that I happen to be up here uh, while when it happened. And she was diagnosed with cancer at the beginning of this year. It was a real shock. Not really sure that cancer ran in her family, but uh, very sad. She was like everybody's uh, mother, uh, you know, um, just everybody loved uh, the, the, the house. I'm not going to say their last name, but the house that they lived in was like a community house. Everybody would go over and hang out in the evenings, and it was it was up. That house was a bustling place back in the 1980s and 90s, I'm here to tell you. But they lost their father from a heart attack back in 2012, and now they lost their mother. Very sad. Very sad. And uh, the other thing is that my mother – and she went to high school together. They were in the same exact high school class together. So my mother, of course, has known her for a long time, too. And so uh, we'll be going to the funeral home tomorrow. And I was just making the comment. I'd seen a friend of mine that I hadn't seen in years last night. And, you know, I went from 1997 to 2012 without ever going to a, to a funeral home. And now within the last four months, I've go, uh, I'm going to be going to the funeral home twice. Of course, my biological mother died back in March, and now um, this woman uh, died last Friday. So that's where I'm going to be going uh, tomorrow. So I had to work on Friday's episode today. I got it all done today because I didn't know how much time I was going to be having tomorrow. So I'll be going back down to the town that I grew up, Leechburg, Pennsylvania. I haven't been there in a while. But that's where the funeral home is that I'll be going to tomorrow. Hello, uh, Melissa. Is that how you say your name? Melissa? Uh, I don't recognize you. You must be new. Welcome to the live show. Thanks for joining in. Uh, I'm going to do something here real quick. If everybody can just hold on for a moment, and then we will move on to other things. So it's been, you know, he called me last Friday to let me know that his, you know, his mother not, you know, passed away and it was you know very sad very sad uh, time so uh, I'm gonna probably see a lot of people uh, that I haven't seen in a while uh, tomorrow probably and we'll see how that goes um, once again I don't get back to um, Leechburg this much these days because my parents don't live there anymore and uh, Emily, uh, hello to you. Susan, good to see you. Diane, thanks for tuning in tonight. Um, next thing, um, the newsletter. I sent out a new July 2018 newsletter yesterday. If you're on the list, you should have gotten it. If you want to get one, please uh, contact me privately, and I will send it to you. It's just a culmination of everything that I talk about maybe sometimes on this show in the episodes just to let you know what's gone on over the last month so if you'd like to receive that please contact me privately either through messenger or at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com and I will send the newsletter to you um, also Emily my assistant you should know I call her my assistant but I've actually never met her in person um, she went to Arkansas's Missing Persons uh, Day yesterday, and she got to meet some people. I think she wrote about it in the group. She posted some pictures, I think, as well. I don't know if she is uh, in here tonight or not. Hello, Rodney. Good to see you. Um, but uh, she was there. Um, I actually made a special unfound shirt for her that she wore to the event 
Um, she got to meet um, Gloria Denton, April Pitzer's mother, who was there. And I think she got to meet some other people. So if you'd be interested in hearing more about that, please uh, track Emily down. And she could surely tell you more about it. But like I said, I think she wrote about it, posted it in the uns uh, discussion group, and also uh, posted some pictures from it. So I appreciate uh, Emily, although she lives in Texas now, she's originally from Arkansas. And I really thank her for going out of her way. She really wanted to, um, you know, go and do that. Hello, LaBrenda. You're uh, another new person, I think. I think that I, very unique name. I think that I would remember that. Um, Shell says, Emily, I, I guess you're meaning Emily. Emily's awesome too. Never met her either, but looking forward to it one day. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for saying that, Michelle. Um, what else went on? My dad and I went to the gun range earlier this week on Monday. I posted that video. Uh, maybe some of you saw it. My dad's 81 years old. He had shot really well. He and I happened to own the same kind of gun. And it, the, the gun range is right down the street. It's not even a mile away. So uh, we went over there. We had a good time. And I posted some pictures and some video regarding that. And then... Really, mostly, uh, the main thing I really got to talk about, at least in this intro, is that um, there is going to be a, an Unfound meetup. I guess you could call it that. Um, some of Unfound's listeners, and I know they probably listen to a lot of other podcasts too, and that's great. They are organizing a get-together in um, Panhandle, Texas, on Saturday evening, so like, what, three days from now. It's going to be at 6.30 at some place called 200 Brick Street. I guess that's some type of bar or restaurant in Panhandle, Texas. It's up in the Panhandle, as you would imagine, and I guess it's about at least an hour away from Canadian, Texas. If you are in the Panhandle and you're just finding out about it now, if you're interested in going, I, of course, will not be there. I'm in Pennsylvania. But I would say that you need to track down Chandra Hinkle Young or Charmin Antel Harp. They're both in the discussion group. If you uh, would like to go, you need the directions or whatever else you may need. Um, I get the feeling that it, there's going to be quite a few people there. And you should also know it's going to be at 6.30 once again Central Time. And it's this Saturday, July 21st. And I wish I could be there. Uh, to my knowledge, this is the first uh, meetup that's ever had anything remotely to do with this podcast. And I cannot thank Charmin and Chandra enough, but I, I believe that the reason they're getting together in that particular area is because of the Thomas Brown case, which, of course, continues to be a hot topic in the discussion group since it's been a month since that episode came out. And it's like it happened yesterday. But um, if you are interested, you need any more information or anything like that, track down Charmin, S-H-A-R-M-I-N, Antel Harp, or Chandra Hinkle Young in the group, and I'm sure they can answer all the questions about if you want to go. Um, I don't know if they're going to do some live broadcast from there. I have no idea. But the other important part I've heard, although I've not talked to her personally about it, is that Penny, Thomas's mother, is going to be there. I've been told, I've heard, that she is. her plans were, as of right now on Wednesday, are to be there. So, um, if you can make it, if you're within a couple hours drive, I think it'll be worth it. I think. And I hope that uh, I get all the details of what's talked about. I don't know if anybody else is going to be there. I don't know if, for example, Thomas's older brother is going to be there. I don't know if uh, the private investigator, Phil Klein, is going to be there. I have no idea. But at least a bunch of um, listeners of Unfound who are interested in that case from the Panhandle, Texas, so Canadian, um, Pampa, Texas, Perryton, Texas, Canadian, Texas, maybe even all the whole way over at Amarillo, are going to be getting together. I have no idea how big the group's going to be, but it, it sounds like it's going to be a, a good time. Uh, Christy, how are you doing? Uh, I see you. Hey, Ed. Hey, right back at you, Christy. And Michelle says that's fabulous, and, and I think so too. Um, 
And Nicole, uh, thank you for joining in tonight. Christy, Carrie, um, thank you all uh, for joining in. Pamela, Jessica, good to see all of you uh, tuning in tonight. We we're just talking about this get together uh, that is going to be happening um, tonight. All right, not tonight, on July 21st, so just a few days from now. And uh, maybe you'll find out some new information about Thomas's uh, case just to get together and talk about whatever you're going to talk about. Uh, sounds like a fantastic time. I, once again, have nothing to do with it, so I, I just could not be more thrilled uh, that some listeners have taken upon themselves uh, to do this. Hello, Anita. How are you doing tonight? Good to see you. Um. So there's that. That's very important. And I will be, it will be mentioned on Friday's episode that comes out. And then um, I will, of course, be talking about it Saturday so nobody forgets if they're in the area and want to go. I will be posting something about it. I'll do everything I can to help these women uh, make this uh, get together meetup uh, success, even though I can't be there. Lisa, what's going on? So there you go. Um, Speaking of which, let me answer, um, and once again, if somebody's going to live broadcast from there, please let me know. I will do what I can to make sure people get to watch it, okay? Um, here's something, though, that I want to talk about uh, real quick. I've gotten, you know, probably over the last, at least the last week or last 10 days, privately and publicly, I have been asked a lot of questions about Phil Klein, and I, and I think this even came up last week. I don't, I'm don't. i going to say this for the record. I mean, I, I know this won't be the last time I have to make this statement, but I'm going to say it again. I don't know him, all right? I, I know that several of you have sent me these stories from Idaho and elsewhere about him. I have no idea, okay? I can neither criticize him nor defend him. I don't know. I wasn't there. Okay. Um, I think for me to get into any of that either way is me stepping into a landmine and a uh, field, land mine, a minefield, and I'm not going to do that. Okay. I'm going to say it again. If Penny thinks he's doing a good job, that's good enough for me. If you. Um, have your concerns about him simply because what you personally may know about him or stories or whatever, as long as they're not rumors or anything, then I would direct those through to Penny. Um, don't direct them toward me. I do not know. Okay. And I'm not going to um, say anything to her one way or the other. Okay. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. All right. Just as I would expect him to behave the same way if he's asked about me being that I came into this and the video and all that stuff. I would expect him to say the same thing. I don't know. All right. You know, because somebody, what do you think about him posting this thing about? I don't know. All right. Uh, he has his methods of whatever he's trying to do. Um, if once again, if Penny likes him and thinks he's done a good job since she found him and he got involved, and he's been involved well before I ever even heard about the case. So uh, I am staying. I don't know. Uh, and it's not that I just am staying out of it. I, I'm going to say it again. I don't know. All right. I can either defend him or criticize him. I wasn't there. You know, and I'm sure there's all sorts of stories with these things that have been posted about him all over the spectrum. I have no idea what's the truth. I have no idea what's rumors. I have no idea. My standard is always if um, a guest thinks that a detective or somebody is doing a good job for them, I'm going to go along with them. Unless I personally find out about something that I can corroborate, I know is fact. And right now, I have no facts regarding anything. So I'm staying out of it. All right? Um my belief is that Phil Klein wants to find out what happened to Thomas Brown, and that's the way Penny feels, so there you go. Okay? <laughs> that's funny, Sarah. So tell us, Ed, do you know? No, Sarah, I don't know. All right? And I think it's been pretty much the standard from the beginning of this 
of this um, podcast that I just don't want to, you know, you know and uh, I hear what you're saying, Sherry, but I have to, I, I know. Um, I got your message, Sherry, but I just have to uh, stay away from it. I'm just staying away from it because, once again, I have all these other cases. I'm not an expert on the case, all right? I do cases each week. I keep in contact with all the guests from all of the cases. And like I said, I just talked to Joyce Rivetuzo before I got on tonight. And, uh, you know, that case is going to move forward probably mostly without me, okay? I just happen to add something to it, okay? So let's move on. Um, am I go uh, Angel had asked me, am I going to see any listeners or guests while um, I'm in Pennsylvania? The plan is to, yes. In fact, uh, I'm probably going to go to a couple places where people have disappeared and check out some things. I plan to go to where Al Copper's car was found. Uh, I plan to meet with the Smatlax while I'm here. I hope to go over to, to uh, Ohio and meet with Ali Negi, uh, whose sister disappeared. Charlotte disappeared. It's a case I covered way back in like February of 2017. I may meet with Al Copper's brother Matt. Um, so I got yes. Um, so I I don't know if I'm going to be meeting any listeners here. But I hope to meet some former guests and go check out some locations. Another thing that I have planned to do, that uh, a case that I really have not talked about that much, is the disappearance of Sherry Mahan from 1985. Uh, you can look that up if you're not familiar with it. That's a disappearance that happened very close to where I used to live in Leechburg. And I'm probably going to go down there and check out some things as well. Uh, because that is a case that I would like to cover. At some point, she was a little girl, like, what, 11 years old or something, who disappeared from Sarver, Pennsylvania. So you can check that out. I know it's on uh, Charlie Project. That's on NamUs. You can check that out. But so I have plans to do that. That was Angel that asked that question. So there you go. Um, let's move on to maybe some news. Did you see this story? about this guy from uh, who killed himself with a helium balloon. I think I posted that. Maybe I didn't post that in the group. But it is one of the strangest suicide uh, stories uh, that you're going to see out there. This guy's name was Alan Abramson, and he is from Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. It's considered to be one of the safest places in Florida. And that's, you know, and that, that's, that's really not saying much. Um, he killed himself with, a, with a, uh, a balloon in that they still have not found the gun, but they discovered that in the weeks before he disappeared or he, he died, he got helium, he got a, a weather balloon, so a huge balloon. A weather balloon is a fairly large balloon filled it with helium and attached a gun to it, they believe. They've not found the gun or the balloon yet. But then he was found murdered, and what they think he did was he was holding the gun and the, the balloon was wrapped around the gun, so when he shot himself, he let go of the gun, the balloon takes off with the gun. Gone. Gone. And they still have not found the balloon or the, I mean, it might be out in the Atlantic Ocean or in the Gulf of Mexico or out in the Everglades by this time. Who knows? But, I mean, you talk about a crazy story. Now, because the detective that was looking into it, he's thinking, um, you know, this is so weird for a murder, what looked to be a murder, happened in Palm Beach Gardens. And then they went on his computer and found out that he had looked at he had been looking up ways to commit suicide since 2009. So nine years. And I think that that is something that, I mean, I think we've all known maybe somebody who has committed suicide. I know that I had a girl that I was friends with in Las Vegas. Uh, she committed suicide, came out of, you know, kind of came out of nowhere. Her name was Barbara. Really, uh, not a girlfriend of mine or anything, but a good friend. Worked with her at Star Trek. Really good actress. 
writer, playwright, very talented, committed suicide just out of nowhere. And um, you just, uh, we cannot underestimate, hello, Anthony, how are you doing? Um, when people want to do these things that they often, it's not a spur of the moment thing. This, once again, Alan Abramson came up with this very creative way to commit suicide. He had been working on it for years. And so they now believe that it's a suicide, even though they haven't found the gun or this balloon yet. Very, very strange case. And that's why when it comes to many, many you know, these missing persons cases that we have to leave ourselves open to the fact that maybe some of these people did commit suicide, just don't realize it. Um, Cade, say, Cade says, obviously obsessed with creating doubt and mystery in a suicidal action. Well, Kate, I think the reason he did is because generally if you commit suicide, uh, your family does not get any life insurance benefits. So there's that. So I'm sure that that was something that factored into the reason that he chose to do this the way he did. And I even read about it, and I don't watch the show. I've never watched this show. You'll maybe find this hard to believe. But this was actually a plot on CSI from like 15 years ago. Um, where somebody committed suicide once again with a helium balloon. So this guy, I think, kind of ripped off uh, that uh, plot and way to cover up a suicide, be doing it that way. Now, you know, I'm sure there are now people who found out about this who are now looking for the gun and the balloon. Um, but if it's one of these helium balloons, if it's a true strong weather balloon and he did it the right way, those weather balloons can go up to 50, 60,000 feet and be gone. Just be gone. Uh, Kate asked, did they find receipts or diagrams for the suicide? I don't remember that, Kate, but they did find um, information on his, on his computer where he had Googled about committing suicide and helium balloons. And then I think they might have found a receipt somewhere. You may be right that they found that he went out and got a helium tank or something like that, Kate, I believe. So he less he wasn't the greatest. He obviously didn't do a very good job of getting away with it. But maybe he was saying, hey, I want to go out. I want to go out in a creative way and at least cause the cops to, uh, you know, add a little mystery to their lives before they figure it out. Sarah asks, when was this? This was, I think, happened back in January, Sarah, beginning of this year. And uh, Shuri says... I agree because my uncle hung himself and was a big thing about insurance and benefits. Right. I, uh, Michelle says, I too wonder if they'll ever still be together if ever found. I don't know. You know, I doubt they'll ever find it, Michelle. But on the other hand, you know, think about the shuttle explosions between, you know, with like Columbia and you know, coming over Texas. They found all sorts of things. You know, little, you know, they found that tape, that tape recorder. Um, you know, so who knows? I guess it's possible, Michelle. Um, for sure, they would never find that in a coastal location. Probably hung himself. I know what you're saying, Shuri. Um, Anthony says, went to all that trouble and left behind everything behind to investigate it. Genius. I guess you could say that, I guess. And Kimberly, welcome tonight. Good to see you, Kimberly. Thanks for tuning in. You're right, Kate. That's something that goes to the stratosphere. And, you know, once it gets caught up in the jet stream... Uh, who knows? Could go anywhere. Just really could go anywhere. And Jimmy, I know you tuned in late. And Lisa, I see you tuned in as well. And Jill, everyone, it's good to see everyone tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. So I saw that story, and uh, you can, I guess you can never rule anything out in some of these cases. Um, you know, if he had maybe deleted his Google searches and things like that, who knows how long that might have been an unsolved case. Hard to say. Dorothy says he could have bought a policy that covered suicide, would have saved himself 10 years of insurance payments. Maybe. I mean, are there insurance policies that cover suicide? I don't know the first thing about life insurance. So I couldn't even tell you. I don't know the first thing. But um, my general idea is that life insurance companies don't want to cover people who are going to go commit suicide next week. So there's that. So I saw that uh, story that, that kind of caught my eye. Um, let's answer another question. 
Um, where we got here? Dorothy asked me about an FBI call. Um, I can't talk about that FBI call. All right. All I can tell you that it was an important call. Talk to the woman there. Did not talk to an agent there. Talk to her for about 10 minutes. And, um, you have to understand something. Um, and maybe only a few of you realize this, that although I, you know, put out these episodes every week, um, there are cases that I would term long-term cases that really there's not enough information to do an episode on it yet. Uh, there's things still to look into. And so I have a few cases, not many, but a few cases that are in the background. There is no timetable on them to actually be broadcast. They will come out when I think that I'm ready. And at least some of them, I've already talked to a family member or something, but I really feel that um, more needs to be done, especially when I hear about information that might have been lost or information that led this direction or that direction. So what you can learn from my talk with the FBI yesterday is I'm working on a case where the FBI was involved and I am trying to track down some information that the FBI got back in the mid nineties. Yeah. Good luck with that. But I'm giving it my best shot. I can't talk about the case. You know that I really don't talk about cases unless I may post something on the newsletter about upcoming cases, but those are ones that I know are going to be somewhat, they're going to be somewhat soon. But these cases that are more long-term projects, I don't like to um, tease you. You know, I don't want to do that to you. I don't want to get tell you that I'm working on this case and, and then you get all, you know, hyped up about it. And then, you know, six months down the road, like, um, you know, what happened? Um, I don't want to do that to you. All right. That's not fair. I don't think that'd be very nice. All I will tell you that there are usually two or three cases that I have in the background that I'm working. Maybe the Sherry Mahan case is one, but once again, I don't know. I really have not done a lot of work on that one, but I'm just telling you somebody asked I'm in Pennsylvania. I'm going to go check it out, but I really have not done that much work on it. Um, Sarah asks, what's the oldest case you've researched? Well, the oldest case that's ever been covered on Unfound, speaking of Anthony, uh, who's in the, the group, is um, the case from uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin, Evelyn, and her disappearance uh, back in 1953. Um, so that would be the oldest case that has ever been, but I would not say that I really did. I mean, it's Anthony who has done, you know, uh, with his blog, who has done all such, you know, the great work on that case. All right. I have not done much. He has done a lot of writing. He's uh, done a lot of, he's talked to the, he spoke to the family and then he was my guest for that episode uh, back late last year. That's the oldest case that's ever been on Unfound, Evelyn Hartley. But um, me personally, you know, trying to, you know, like dig into something or, or I guess you could put it that way. Um, I would, you know, I really don't know. Um, this case I can tell you uh, regarding the FBI is, uh, of course, it's older than 23 years old. It's, it's before 1995. That's really all I want to say about it. Okay. It's really all I want to say. Um, so that's pretty old. I, you know, once again, um, me making phone calls, things like that, where it doesn't seem like anybody else is doing anything at the moment. And in this particular case, I have talked to at least one family member about it, but this person knows that it may be a while because once again, people are being, I'm asking people, the FBI and other people to really dig and go back and find some things that I believe have been lost. So, Sarah, that's just hard to say. You know, I don't want you to anybody ever to get the idea that uh, I am some, you know, deep, 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 deep researcher. 
in a couple things I am, but really I'm a reporter. I go out and find the uh, the people who already know these things, and then I interview them so you can find out what they know. All right. As I've said, although I haven't said it recently, I think that the research that a lot of podcast hosts talk about is totally, totally overblown. All right. I, I, that's what I believe. Um, a lot are just going out there onto the internet and finding what's ever, uh, already out there. When I, but when I talk about research, it's finding things that have been lost, that aren't on the internet, that might be in some evidence room, that have been forgotten. That's what strikes me as research. You know, finding those things that not just anybody can find. All right, that's my standard. And so I'm not much uh, of a, a researcher. I'm a little bit of an investigator, which I think is different in that with the Thomas Brown case. Penny sends me the videos. Sure, I'll look at them. You know, is that research? No, I didn't go out and find those videos and, you know, get them and bring them back. She sent them to me, and I sat there for like 20 hours watching video. I'm investigating it. She sends me the evidence. I look at it. I, you know what I saw. So um, with the FBI, uh, I have to make another phone call. I didn't have time to do it today. I don't know if I'll do it tomorrow because of the funeral, but I have to call another FBI office, and I hope uh, – FBI was perfectly fine. They call, I left a message. They called me back the next day. Could not have been a better conversation, but I don't have any answers yet. So there you go. Uh, Jessica says, maybe I will be on time next Wednesday. Well, you know what, Jessica? I'll be here next Wednesday. All right, so you don't have to worry about that. I'll be here. Um, that's fine. Um, so, Dorothy, that is is about um, the extent that I can tell you. And, you know, it should be known. I don't know if you saw this, but uh, the Unfound podcast page uh, got a rating a few days ago um, from what I believe is like some kind of fake profile. And it only, you know, it only got three out of five stars. And the comment was, well, this guy always teases stuff. He always teasing things and he doesn't tell you the whole story. Well, you know, there are things that I can't say. And I think this was in, in relation to the update episode from last Friday. And, you know, I, I have to tell you, it's a very popular episode. Lots of downloads since last Friday. I try to tell you as much as I am allowed to say. All right, I will always stand by that. And that is not uh, in a way to try to make myself seem superior or I want to know things so you can. That is not the case. I will always say I am one of you. Okay, I, I keep saying that. I just happen to have the microphone. And I'm very supportive of any listeners who want to start their own, uh, own podcast, True Crime Podcast. I'll help anybody who wants to do that. Uh, I, I don't think that I'm sitting up here on a, a throne. I'm not on a stage. You're not the audience. I'm not a rock star. You aren't the fans. That's not the really way I look at it at all. Um, but there are just certain things that I learn about stuff that I can't say. And um, I think that all of you – so when that person wrote that, it's like, well, obviously this person doesn't understand the kind of position, you know, you know, what Unfound is all about, all right? So, um, and I just try to, I, I'm always honest with you, okay? I'm never going to mislead anybody. I'm not going to try to tease things or anything like that, okay? Um, I'm always going to tell you as much as I can, and I'm always going to try to get my guests to tell you as much as they can. But ultimately, um uh, they are responsible for the information, and they get to decide what people know and what people don't, okay? And I'm not going to hold that against them. Still, I think that the way that, uh, that the interviews have been conducted since day one, that you find out more about any of these cases than you're going to find out anywhere else because these guests, you know, trust me, trust all of you. They trust the format, and most of all, they enjoy, uh, and I've had more than one guest tell me this, they enjoy getting to tell the story the way they want to do it. They aren't taking out of context. I'm not trying to dominate the conversation. 
I ask the questions. All I do is guide the conversation. We have an outline and I guide it and I help them along to make sure that nothing is missed. That's my job when it comes to the interviews themselves. And in contrast to like disappeared, which will interview, you know, somebody for three hours and only use five minutes or they'll interview somebody and then the answers will be taken out of context. You know, that's not what I do. And um, uh, that's why the episodes are two hours, three hours long. That's just the way it goes. Hello, Angie. How are you? Thank you for the thumbs up, Christine. Um, yeah, Dorothy says we have over 3,000 members. Yes, in the group. Uh, I think that uh, for as far as likes and everything over on the page, Dorothy, I think it's like 1,600 some. So it was, you can you can find that. I, once again, I don't even look at my ratings anymore. That's just something that popped up. I haven't even been to iTunes to look at Unfound's reviews, I'm going to say, in a year. That's that's the honest to God truth. I have not been on iTunes to see what anything is going on there in a year because I don't like iTunes, so I don't go there. I know I need to be there, and that's why Unfound is there. Otherwise, I don't go. I just don't go. So I don't check reviews and stats and, and things unless something is emailed to me like with Podomatic when I was number one or the stats that get sent to me for Stitcher and then I pass those along. I don't just try to go out and find those things. Uh, Holly says, I love the long episodes. Well, thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, how did you come up with the name Unfound other than the obvious? Sarah asks. That's a great question. Um, Sarah, uh, I toyed around with, uh, a lot of different titles before I came up with that one. I think that one word titles are best. Um, you know, um, I don't know, you know, it's, you know, it's been like two years now and it took me a little while. I mean, and I'm a fairly creative guy, and I'm good with words. And um, you know, just really have to sit down and think, what's the program going to be about? It's going to be about trying to find these people who are haven't been found, so they're unfound. And but I, I guess I toyed around with five or six different titles before I came out with that one. And then I think it really worked. Once again, Stephanie, who's I know watching tonight, uh, of course, it really, really worked. Eventually, when the new logo with the, um, you know, the magnifying glass uh, was put in the middle, and then it was like, oh yeah, well that's spectacular. So, and that's that we've been using that logo for over a year now. So, um, you know, I know, it, you know, Generation Y, Thinking Sideways, Up and Vanished, The Vanished. Um, you know, I think they're all great titles. They're all very creative. Um, you know, but I just thought that, you know, I just want to kind of go with a one word title and just leave it at that, you know, because once I think once you get into multiple words, then you have to start thinking, well, how's it going to look on this? And the formatting becomes an issue. If you want to do anything, I just wanted to go with one word. That's a great, Sarah, that's a fantastic question. I don't think anybody's asked me that yet. Um, Rodney asked me, have you ever looked into the Heather Teague case from Evansville, Indiana? I've not, Rodney. I've not. I can't say that off the top of my head I'm familiar with it. It's probably one of those things if I were to read the facts of the case, I'd probably say, oh, yeah. But off the top of my head, I have not. I have not. Um, huh. Weird comment. Yeah, Stephanie, I know. If you found it, did you go to – yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, um, weird comment, weird review. Yeah, well, Stephanie, if you go check it out, you'll find that it's a character from what is that cartoon? Uh, it's a character from the car a cartoon that made the comment. It wasn't even somebody's real name with a real picture. So there you go. Uh, Kimberly asks, I have a question about the logo. Why did it change to a picture of a man on iTunes podcast? And who is the gentleman in the pic? Uh, Kimberly, I don't know anything about that. I do not know anything about that at all. Um, that's totally news to me. Um, 
you know, all of the information that iTunes gets, it gets from my Podomatic feed. And I can go check that. That's going to – see, now you're going to have me worried about that. Um, let me check that for a second. And it should be the Unfound logo. So I don't know what uh, – Mandy, welcome. Um, I don't – uh, Stephanie, thank you for that. Kimberly, I'll message you a pic of it from my podcast library. You know what, Kimberly? I don't know what to say about that. Um, let me pull up iTunes while I'm here. I haven't been there in a while, but let's see if I can find. Uh, let's see if I can find it. And uh, on my other computer. I'm on iTunes right now, uh, Kimberly, and it is the Unfound logo. So I don't know what to tell you about that. That's really weird. It's a picture from one of the cases. It looks like the ego is still fine in mine. Mine is the Unfound logo on iTunes. Uh, Kimberly, you may have to clear your cache, the cache or something, C-H-C-H-E, however you do that. So there you go. Um, let's talk about this week's case. Um, yeah, Kimberly, you may want to look into your settings or something. Um, this week's case is a tough one. I mean, they're all difficult. Don't get me wrong. But this week we have the disappearance of R Renee Lamana from Ocean City, New Jersey slash Summers Point, New Jersey on J January 8th, 1994. The guest for the episode is her sister, Margaret. This is a case, once you hear it, it's going to remind you a lot of the Claudia Wells case where a woman disappears, had some mental issues, and then later she is seen and the family starts looking into it and can never, and of course in Robin's case, Claudia Wells' daughter, to this day she's not been able to track her mother down. It's been, you know, 20 years. This is a similar type of situation that where uh, Renee was having some mental issues. Her boyfriend had just broken up with her. She was seen wandering the streets of Queens, New York. She was uh, admitted to a hospital there. Her sister, Margaret, went up and picked her up, brought her down to her house in Ocean City, New Jersey, not Ocean City, Maryland, Ocean City, New Jersey, and had the full in intention of her of admitting her to a hospital down there because she could see that Renee uh, wasn't quite right. And this was very unusual for Renee. She suffered from panic attacks over life, but nothing like this. And uh, what happened was Renee ran out the do door on a dark January night in Ocean City, New Jersey, right there on the Atlantic Ocean, and she disappeared. And so her, her sister automatically called the Coast Guard, called a canine unit and called the Ocean City Police. They all showed up. An hour and a half later, Renee was allegedly seen uh, a few miles away in a bar at Summers Point, New Jersey, a place called the Waterfront Restaurant and Bar, which isn't there anymore. I think it's under a different name now. She was there. She disappeared around 7 from the house. She showed up at this bar around 8.30. The police were able to track that down, allegedly a sighting. The problem is that only one employee at this restaurant saw her, vanished from there, and then in December of 1994, she was allegedly seen on a New York subway by a postal worker who was going to work. And then from there, she wasn't seen again, but then three or four months later, she was seen at a car dealership in Northfield, New Jersey. So that would have been like April of 1995. She has never been seen again. All right. There is no reliable sighting of her. And there's something that popped up in 2015, but we don't get too much into that because that sighting has now been discredited. But there were three sightings of Renee in approximately the year and a half after she disappeared. And her family was not able to track her down. 
They put flyers everywhere. They did everything that you could do in 1994, 95. And then when the internet came along, um, they've done everything that they could with that as well. And um, still, Renee is still missing. The episode, the title of this episode is called The Woman from the Island. And we talk about, you know, being that I live on an island, I know a little bit about that. There are only so many ways off of it. And if the police had done their job, I think, back at that night, if they'd been able to go to these like three bridges that lead off the island of Ocean City, New Jersey, they might have been able to stop her, find her if she got in a car or something. They didn't do that. They dismissed this as just this woman running away, that she wasn't having the health issues, the mental health issues that her sister said she was. And because of that, they lost their opportunity to track Renee down. And so here we are over 24 years later and Margaret uh, is still trying to figure out what happened to uh, Renee. Now the tough part is this, is that do we believe these eyewitness accounts? Um, because I, all of you are very smart. All of you are true crime aficionados. You know that Eyewitness accounts are notoriously unreliable. But in each of these cases, these sightings, both that night and then the two others, Margaret and I go through in detail both of those sightings and what those uh, people said they saw. And Margaret is in touch with all of these people even to this day. And they still claim that they saw Renee. You're going to be asked to decide whether these people actually saw Renee or not. On top of that, uh, it is believed that the way that Renee even made it to this uh, restaurant slash bar in Summers Point was she rode, somehow she got a ride there. Now the tough part, whoever, if she did get a ride to this uh, restaurant, somebody picked her up along the side of the road. Whoever picked her up has never come forward in 24 years. So you're going to ask me uh, ask to be to think about that as well. And once it's a very like I said, it's a lot like Claudia Wells's case, in that people claim to have seen Claudia in Santa Monica and San Diego and Texas, and then when Robin has shown up, she's never been able to track her mother down. So if you are familiar, if you haven't listened to the Claudia Wells case from last year, you might want to listen to it uh, before you listen to the new episode this Friday. Once again, Renee Lamana, L-A-M-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, she disappeared from Ocean City, New Jersey, with sightings in Summers Point, Queens, New York, and Northfield, New Jersey in the, the proceeding year and a half. But her disappearance happened on Jan January 8th, 1994, uh, in the evening, like around 7 o'clock in the evening, January 8th, 1994. Okay? And I think that we can uh, learn a lot from this, and I hope that, you know, some people want to get involved uh, with this case and try to figure out, is it possible that she made it to, uh, is she still out there? Um, and the other issue is that Renee could really blend in. She was very educated. And she could speak like five different languages or something. So, and she had been to the Middle East. She had been to Africa. She knows those cultures very well. And it would be very easy for her to blend in if she for maybe forgot who she was or, or whatever the case may be. So, um, it's a tough case. These ones where there are multiple sightings that could be believed, they're tough. They're tough. So that's this week, this Friday's uh, case, Renee Lamana. I think that uh, this has been covered before. I think the Thin Air podcast maybe did this about a year and a half ago. Uh, but as usually the case, the episode Friend Found is going to be way longer than that episode was. And I think that we get a little bit more into the details uh, than they did. Uh, Sarah, how old was she? She was in her 30s. She was in her 30s when she disappeared. Um, and, and Michelle says, don't like the sound of that. Sounds suspicious. Michelle, it does. I agree with you. Angie is asking me, can I ask you what is on the back of the door over on the left? Okay. Uh, Angie, those are a, a pin collection. 
Those are pins from various states and universities and schools and sports teams and um, national parks and tourist locations uh, around the United States and elsewhere. Uh, right here, this right here. These, these are all these are all pins right there. So that's uh, Angie. Thank you for asking that. You got like five thumbs up on that. So obviously a lot of people were wondering about that. Um, Kara says, long, love the long episodes. Listen to them at work, Kara. Thank you very much. So I hope that answers the question about what is going on uh, in the background here. Roseanne, thanks for tuning in tonight. Th good to see you. And see who else is tuned in. Mandy, uh, good to see you as well. But um, yes, Angie, those are pins on the, on the window. Okay, there you go. Uh, my mother and father used to collect them. They don't do so much of that now. But at one time, they were big into that. And so that's like a press board um, where you could just push them into the board and they just stay there. That's what that is. So I'm going to ask, uh, answer one more question, and then I think we're going to call it a night. Um, Nadia had asked me, is it difficult to get guests? Um, it used to be. Uh, early on, it was. Uh, in fact, in the update episode last week, I, I explained my first call to uh, Mary Lyle. Uh, and it has certainly gotten easier since then. It is also easier now because other people help me find guests, like Emmy, Emily uh, has been helpful. Um, Dennis Mann has been helpful, of course, has appeared. And then he's helped me find some guests, some other listeners have helped me find some guests. Of course, Anthony, Anthony, who I know is at least in here in the group at one time tonight, uh, of course, has been on Unfound a couple times and did a really nice job. Um, Mary Lyle has sent me guests my way. For example, Joyce Rivetuzo, I I've discovered her uh, through uh, through Mary Lyle. Veronica Freer, uh, Mary Lyle sent my direction. So um, it used to be. Uh, a lot harder, and now it's a lot easier. But I would not say that it's easy. I mean, there are still a lot of people who don't know what podcasting is, have never heard of Unfound. You know, um, Emily contacts them or I contact them, and they're like, who, what, when, where? So that still happens. Um, you just have to realize that uh, if there are rejections or people don't write you back, not to take it personally. All right, so it still happens, but it's easier now than it was a year and a half ago, and it's easier now than it was a year ago. Um, but th that's probably still, it's probably the most difficult part of doing the program, finding the guests. Other people who do different types of podcasts that say other things are probably more difficult, but for Unfound, sure. Uh, finding guests uh, can be difficult, but it's a lot easier than it used to be, and I think once again, I think because Emily, myself, and whoever else, uh, we know what to do. We know where to go. Uh, we have a track record now of success. We have a very good reputation. Um, people can now, if they wonder what the show is, I can send them the link. They can listen to some of the interviews, find out what the show is about. All of that helps. Um, Christina, welcome tonight. Sarah asked me, how do you introduce yourself to guests? Well, um, just depends. If I'm contact, if I'm talking to them for the first time, uh, it's going to be different than Emily contacting them first for the first time. It's going to be different than Mary Lyle talking to some of these people and sending them my way. It just depends. But, um, you know, how do I introduce my personal self? I'm just, uh, I'm just as upfront as I can be. I am just absolutely honest, you know, and what I tell and some of the guests who are former guests will tell you the first time I talk to guests, I just explain to them, this is not an interview. This is just two people talking. It's just a conversation. That's all it is. This is not an interview. Nothing is official. Nothing is on the record. Nothing. And I really ask those guests, those people I talk to. You can ask me anything you want about myself, about the program. I want you to feel comfortable with me. 
You know, if you don't know what podcasting is, I'll explain it to you. If you want to know why I got into this, I'll explain it to you. If you want to know my educational background, I'll explain it to you. If you want some references or something, I'll explain it to you. And I'll give you names. If you want to talk to some of my former guests, I'll do that. I just am as upfront as is humanly possible. And all I ask in return is that we have a conversation about the disappearance and I ask them questions about it. That is the what happens every time. It's just a conversation. Two people talking. Nobody else is listening. You know, uh, and I think that that's the way, uh, that's how I introduce myself, Sarah. Uh, Tara, great to see you. I'm up here in uh, Butler, Tara. How are you? I was just talking about Sherry Mahan earlier. Uh, I don't know if you heard that or not. Uh, Christina, Kate says, you definitely dive deeper and much more sincere and earnest in your questions than a lot of other podcasts. Thank you. I feel they really recall their time with their loved ones more so than in other interviews. Kate, I appreciate that. Um, I think what adds to that is that when you listen to Unfound's interviews, you know that nothing's being taken out of context. That if the interview was two hours, it's two hours, just minus the mistakes. <laughs> and uh, that's something that I explained to my guests before we officially do an interview, that it's not live, it's recorded. If we make mistakes, if you misstate something, you want to rephrase it, just do it. And when I go through the inter interview afterward, it comes out. But I can assure you, the interview plays exactly the way it was recorded. Nothing's switched around or misplaced, and for something from the end is put at the beginning. It just plays out exactly as it recorded. All right, uh, that's the way I believe. Not just true crime journalism, but that the way is the way sh all journalism should be done. Every single bit of it. Don't take things out of context. Don't edit stuff. Just let it play. That is my attitude. Uh, Christina says, just rushed out of work to see the last few minutes of you live. Christina, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, we covered quite a bit tonight, I think. Took some questions. Um, Tara says, damn, I missed it. I will rewatch the show. Welcome back to the area, right, Tara. Thank you. Um, uh, Tara, I don't know if you heard, but, uh, Doug Brand Todd's mother, uh, passed away. Uh, so I'm going to be down at the funeral home tomorrow. Uh, Tara is from Leechburg as well, and she knows who I'm talking about. So I'm going to be going down there tomorrow. But we've been doing this a little for over an hour. And once again, what did we talk about? We talked about, um, let's see, we went through going to the funeral home tomorrow. We talked about the newsletter. If you did not get the newsletter, if you think you're on the list, you need to get one, let me know. If you want to be on the list, contact me privately. I'll get you the newsletter. We talked about Emily going to the Arkansas Missing Persons Day. I uh, went to the gun range earlier this week by my dad. He's 81 and still has a great shot. want to once again remind all of you about the meetup that is happening in Panhandle, Texas. Yes, that is a town. Panhandle, Texas, Saturday evening, July 21st, 6.30 p.m. at the Backstreet. 200 is that right the back street brick street 200 restaurant or bar in panhandle texas uh if you're interested in going Charmin antel harp or chandra hinkle young are the people who are organizing it so we talked about that i didn't even get to mention i'm wearing my sister made me an unfound shirt how do you like that that's stitching right there the books uh really thank all of the new uh newer paypal and patreon members um, uh, the cards, shirts, books, all of that. Talked about the guy who committed suicide using a gun in a helium balloon. And then took some questions from the audience. And then finally, we talked about the disappearance of Renee Lamana, who disappeared from Ocean City, New Jersey on January 8th, 1994. The episode is called The Woman from the Island. That will be Friday's episode, and it will come out on time. Uh, Gary says, will your dad train me to shoot? I don't know, uh, if he could do that, Carrie. I don't know. Um, I, that's a funny question. I haven't thought about it. Uh, Sarah says, thank you for the comp. And I'm going to read that because that would be self-indulgent, Sarah. Thank you. And Carrie says, I'm missing, missing the meetup by one week, but hope to catch next one. I see it being a real hit. Carrie, maybe the live stream it or record something and post it on in the group or something. So 
Um, that's something to ask the people who are arranging it. All I know is I won't be there, but I cannot thank the people who are going to do that meetup enough. And my understanding is that Thomas Brown's mother, Penny, will be there. So after that, I'm going to leave. I got to go. Uh, thank you all. Great seeing you. Thanks for all the questions and comments. 134 comments tonight. Uh, it's beautiful. We had a lot of uh, viewers tonight. Uh, you will hear me Friday, the disappearance of Renee LaMana. And then anybody that's going to the meetup this Saturday, I hope you all have a great time. I want to hear all about it. Favorite time of the week for me. Thank you so much. And I will talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.